Okay, we began the series with a question way back when. Why should we study the Old Testament? And we said that it was the revelation of God's redemptive work through Jesus Christ. That's why. It is, it is a picture, all this Old Testament stuff, this old stuff before Jesus came, is a picture and a revealing of what God is doing to bring Jesus here and to have that final place in heaven at the end. And when we keep this in mind, it grants, it gives us the ability to respond to him and his work properly. We understand when things happen in our life, we understand that it's God's work. God's still in control. He still has a plan that he's working out. There is an end to this plan. It has never changed. So we know how to better react and respond to him given that... uh, that understanding. It also helps us uh, to respond to the world better. So we look at the world, we look at politics, we look at America, we see what happens, we see the hard things that people do to one another in this world, and we understand it fits in God's plan. God's not confused by it. And we are better able and more effective at encouraging one another because we understand God has a plan and we understand God as he reveals himself in the Old Testament. Have you ever been able to open up the Psalms and read the Psalms during some hard time and it helps? Yeah? I think the older we get, the more we shake our head, yes, I've, I've been there. Right? When we need wisdom, we open up our Proverbs And we look through Proverbs and we see God's truth. How about God's faithfulness? Do we see God's faithfulness in the Old Testament through the stories and the letters in the Old Testament? Yeah, we do. We see God hasn't changed. He's still with his people. He's still doing what he said he was going to do. How about God's promises? Do we see God's God's word is never changing by looking through the Old Testament? Yes? Of course we do. So if there's something that God has promised us today through the New Testament, is it any less, is He any less faithful to do a promise that He gave in the New Testament than He was in the Old Testament? He changes not. So the Old Testament helps us understand and respond to him and his work and what he's doing. It helps us to to respond to the world and the ugly things and the strange things that are happening in the world. It also helps us to encourage one another. I can come to you and I can give you something. Like today, we looked at Ruth, the opening chapter of Ruth. We have a lady in our Bible study class who has been hit by the world. She's in a hearing. She feels she's unjustly accused. It is... I mean, she could lose her job. I mean, just everything. Boom, 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 boom. And we went to Ruth, and we looked at that first chapter with Naomi. There was a famine. Pushed the family out. He lo- she lost her husband. She lost her sons. She's in a foreign country. She has nothing. And she says, God has dealt with me very bitterly. I know Naomi. I've lived Naomi. Amen, brother. Yeah? But do you know what? God moved the famine to get her out in the first place. God allowed her husband to go. God allowed her sons to go. Why? Because God needed Ruth back in Bethlehem to meet Boaz. Why? Because he promised back in Genesis chapter 3 that he would send a deliverer and his name is Jesus. And if Ruth hadn't gotten back and gotten with Boaz, David would have never been born. If David's never born, then Jesus would have never been born. So every single detail along the way, God is present there. I understand Naomi because I understand God. I understand better how it affects my life because I understand God. Does that make sense? Not quite. Uh, would you expound on how you understand God? It makes him almost your inferior. What do you mean by you understand God? Three years ago, nearly, I was dismissed 
fired. No reason giving, given. I was making good money. We had just bought this house. I'm thinking, life is good. God is good. He's blessing us. Right? And I'm like, wait a minute. Fired? For what? What did I do wrong? Six months I'm having nightmares over this. I'm wrestling with the, the, the chief chairman of the tribe going, why did you fire me? What did I do? How come you didn't warn me? You gave me no disciplinary action. You didn't write me up. You just walked in and said, we want your keys. Now my family's hurt. I have no money. We run out of everything. We could lose our house. God, what are you doing? That's Naomi. Well, now, look back at Naomi and go, every single thing God does for his purpose. He has an end. He has a goal. There is a strategy. It is everything detailed out bit by bit, bad and good. We can't just say God allows only the good things to happen. What good happened to Daniel? Got his nuts chopped off, for one. Well, could you say that with ladies present a little bit better? <laughs> He's a eunuch. He was a eunuch, and so were the other three. Uh -oh. Yes, they made him. He was a young man. He was 15, 20 years old, prince of, of Jerusalem of Israel. They, he, the, his country was overtaken by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians. They took him away. They castrated him, more than likely. That was the tradition of the time. Although it doesn't specify that. We know that that's probably what happened. He never married. There's no mention of him being married. He lived in exile, in captivity, as a slave his entire life. Which was probably... Daniel. Daniel. Daniel, in the, Daniel in the lion's den. They castrated all the boys. Shadrach, Meshach, Bendigo, all them. When they pulled them out, they would castrate them. Pulled them out of their homeland. Nebuchadnezzar was a Babylonian, not a Jew. When he came in, he conquered everything and took some of the elite people to serve in his court. So they castrated them and made them eunuchs, basically. They became eunuchs. Servants were usually eunuchs like that. So here's Daniel. It's at the end of the 70 years. Now, mind you, he was in captivity at least 70 years because we know that God said that it was 70 years that they would, that Israel would be in captivity, that they would be enslaved. So he is serving his whole time as a slave the entire time, no family, and at the end of the 70 years, He, gets, he knows that the 70 years is coming up. Jeremiah prophesied it would be 70 years. He knew Jeremiah. He's praying every day. God, bring us back, bring us back, bring us back, bring us back, bring us back. He never went back. Did God's purpose fail somehow? Are you sure God didn't get something wrong with Daniel? Oh, Daniel, you had 70 plus years of faithful, godly service certainly God messed up somewhere and didn't get you back home to give you your reward. Are you sure? No. God doesn't make mistakes. If God doesn't make mistakes and God is in control and God put Daniel in Babylon, then understand this principle, not all discomfort is bad. That's rough. That's a hard one. Because when God sends you a check for $2,000 in the mail that you don't expect, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But when God says, I don't need you in that job anymore, you're going to get fired. I'm going to move you for three, three years. You're going to be unemployed. And you're just going to learn how to have faith in me. We go, where's God? Ouch. <laughs> that's what we see that's what we typically get but part of that is because we're not looking at this time just like we don't look at the Old Testament very often from the standpoint of 
God's perspective, the highest perspective. We look at it from the me perspective, the hero, the Daniel. What can I learn from Daniel? Well, I can learn that I can go over and walk really good with God. I have to be righteous. I have to do this. I have to do that. And I can get a really good moral lesson out of Daniel. Is it about a moral lesson out of Daniel? No. It's about a God who has a plan with a king. His name is Jesus. He's going to... He's put Jesus on the throne. He's pulling together a people who he is going to make holy, blameless, perfect, and eligible to become the gift to his son, the king, as his bride. That's God's purpose. Well, was that happening in Daniel's time? Yes. You just have to look at it from that perspective and look, go through oh okay now I understand a little bit better that's why I say I understand Naomi better now you said you understood God yes I understand God from the standpoint of I know that no matter what happens in my life that it has to still fit in God's overall plan you see it through a veil maybe through a veil very good yes So if I find myself in hardship or if I look in the Old Testament and I find something that just does not make sense, it's like so out of place. Why would God put that there? It is there specifically to reveal God's work and God's character. And if I go to the Old Testament with that perspective, with that in mind, it will all fit better. Remember we started the, the, why should we read the Old Testament? There was this, New Testament doesn't fit with Old Testament. There's so many things that clash and seem to contradict one another. It's because we're looking at it from me perspective, the lowest perspective, from the God's person, God's hero perspective, rather than looking at it from, well, God's got a plan. I don't know every detail of that plan, but I know where it's going. And if I know where it's going and I'm in that plan, I don't have to worry about now. I know that even now God's got it covered. So, we looked at that. And I don't want to go into too much more detail. This is what we what I said we would use. It's in your it's in the handout, this one here. So I have one Esther I'll cover. Looks like this. Did you get one, Esther? Okay. Huh? Okay, well, you don't have to worry about it right now. Basically, what we're looking at is I want to show you that God's plan is consistent. He hasn't changed the plan. The plan is the same. What has happened or developed as the plan has worked its way out has created different things. So, for instance, in the beginning, we looked at Genesis 1 and 2, creation. What about God's people? God created a people and said he blessed them, gave them rulership. There was perfect fellowship between God and man, man and woman, man and other man, and man and the environment. He ruled it. There was no problem with animals. You didn't have to worry about walking up to a lion and, and hi, how you doing? Without being eaten. You didn't have to worry about that because a lion wouldn't eat you. That wasn't there at the time. So the environment, there was no weeds. Yay. Yeah, whoo! You didn't have to, you didn't have, you still had to work, but it was not hard work, harsh work, sweaty work. And God's image was in man. And it was, God said, multiply, multiply, be fruitful and multiply. My purpose, my desire is that you take my image, the image that I've put within you, and multiply and reproduce that image in many, 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 many people forever and ever and ever and ever die. That was the, the spoken intent. However, in Genesis chapter 3, we had the fall. Eve was tempted. Adam listened to his wife. The fault falls on Adam, not on Eve, according to the New Testament. And so we have not just God's blessing on people, but we now have judgment entering the world. What happened this minute you ate the fruit? You shall surely die. die. What is death? It's judgment on your sin. You've done something wrong. You've disobeyed. The punishment is 
death. That's judgment. So now, through Adam and Eve, you have both blessing and judgment. And that's the way it's going to be for the rest of the time, all the way to the point of the cross, without that need for salvation and grace and redemption, as well as judgment and punishment for sin, you wouldn't have the cross. And what happened to the fellowship? No mas? What do you mean, no mas? What does that mean, no mas? I'm um, in red, it says it's broken. <laughs> it was broken. Well, I mean, you can think of what that means. Do you have perf- Are you walking in the garden in the cool of the day with God, God, Almighty God? No. Do you have, if you were to be in God's presence, would you have no shame, no fear, no guilt? No. The relationship is broken. I can't, I don't have fellowship with God like Adam had fellowship with God before the fall. It's broken. It needs to be fixed. Something has to repair it. So God's image that he put within us is now marred or scarred. And we're just going to stay in this last one through Noah for uh, at least today. But I, wanna, I want you to keep in mind this bottom line. That we have blessing and judgment now. That the fellowship is broken. And that the image that God has put within man is, is uh, marred and scarred by sin. Okay? With that said, turn to Genesis chapter 5, please. It's at the very front of your Bible. It's the first book. All right. Remember that we said, if we're going to look at the Old Testament, the stories in the Old Testament, etc., et we're going to look at it from the standpoint of, this is God's revelation of God's redeeming work. So, anytime we read a story, anytime we read a passage, the first thing that should pop in our mind is that there is a question. How does this show God redeeming His people for His kingdom to His glory? How does it fit into the plan? Remember his promise back in Genesis 3.15? We talked about this before a class uh, with Phyllis. That God promised, said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and her, Eve, and between your offspring and her offspring. He, singular, will crush your head. What would happen if you took a snake and you crushed its head? What would happen? It would die. So, who's the offspring of Eve? Jesus. It goes from her offspring, he. Not her offspring, they. Her offspring, he. Jesus Christ will crush your head. Kill you. I was having an argument or a debate with someone uh, yesterday. And he said in the Bible it says that there's going to be a fight between angels and demons. But there's like a third of angels compared to demons. It's interesting when you the the, the her comment was she was having a uh, comment or debate with someone that there's going to come a time when demons and angels will fight and clash someday and have this big war, but that the demons are only a third of what the angels are and it's going to be really awesome and cool. I think it's going to be a little bit less than that. I think Jesus is just going to stand there and, and it's going to be done. There's not. There's, there won't be a struggle like, at all. There's like three times as many demons as there is angels. I was like, why does that matter? No, that's backwards. There's three times as many angels as there is demons. The the, the, the what he the the what he's referring to about the one third and all that the three times is there a third of the angels Satan took with him when he fell. I think that's what he's trying to play with. Well, he said there was more demons than there was. Angels. No, that is not true. And who is he? Jacob. Okay. Well, let's 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 get back. So the idea being is that uh, God made a promise to bring a deliverer. The deliverer is going to crush Satan's head. Yes, Satan will bite him on the heel, but Satan is going to be crushed. Uh, and the people in Adam's day, they anticipated that deliverer. 
They knew he was coming. They, they, they held on to that promise through those early years. And we're going to find that in chapter 5. We're going to find that the descendants of Adam knew that promise and knew that that deliverer was coming. So let's go to chapter 5. Let's read it. And then we'll see what, where we're going to go from here. Okay? So here's chapter 5. You ready? This is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own image, or his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. And after he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived 912 years, and then he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. And after he became the father of Kenan, Enosh lived 815 years and had another, other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enosh lived 905 years, and then he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahalalel. And after he became the father of Mahalalel, Kenan lived 840 years and had another, other sons and daughters. Altogether, Kenan lived 910 years, and then he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared. And after he became the father of Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Mahalalel lived 895 years. Altogether now? And then he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. And after he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. Did he make him an angel? So he was a he was the first one not to actually die. Not Elijah. Well, he's the first one to actually die. He will. Three hundred and sixty five years compared to nine hundred years, and then God took him. Like, took him die, away. Or he just, like, went up to heaven? Mm, means he went to heaven. God just took him up. Gone. Let's keep going, though. Come on, let's keep going. Verse 25. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Elimech. And after he became the father of Elimech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived 969 years, and then he died. When Elamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. After Noah had, well, was born, Lamech lived 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived 777 years and then he died. After Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right. Here's the very first question. Now, I'm looking at this thing and going, all right, I've just read this long genealogy. So what? Why is this important and why is it in the Bible? What should I walk away from after reading Genesis chapter 5? What were you going to say? I was just going to say, if we didn't have Adam, we wouldn't have Noah. If we didn't have Adam, we wouldn't have Noah. So you're telling me that this is to tell us that Noah came from Adam. I'm assuming. I'm assuming. It's just a really long way of saying it. Just a really long way of saying it. You're right. It is a really long way of saying it because he could have just said Noah was a descendant of Adam. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a, a little bit of help. How many do we have here? How many generations was that? Ten generations. <laughs> Phil, Phyllis is all, oh, I'm so glad I got a picture. <laughs> you going to share or do you want one? Sure. All right. Here. You share? Okay. Oops. 
Here is the breakdown of ages and when people were born, when their sons were born, and when did everybody die. Do you have enough for everybody? I do. I have plenty for everyone. One, two, you got it all? Oh, you did it. I, I was wondering when we read this, how many that were mentioned were still alive when Noah built the ark and the flood came. His grandfather and his great-grandfather and his great-great-grandfather were probably still alive, weren't they? Well, that was, that was one of the questions. I just want to quickly look at this. If this chapter is only a genealogy, and if it's only about this is how Noah got here, that's one thing. But the question that we want to ask is, is how does this passage reveal God's redemptive work? How do we see that? How do we see that from that upper level? If we, excuse me, if we don't, we look at it from the personal level instead, which is what pe people would typically do in this one. If we were looking at this from a uh, God's hero standpoint or a personal level, who do you want to be like? When you read this chapter, where do you go? Enoch. Enoch. Why? God liked him so much. God liked him so much, he didn't even let him die. He just took him straight to heaven. What did he do? The different? rapture. <laughs> what was so different about Enoch than all the rest of them? That's a great question. What did Enoch do? What was, what was different about him? Does this passage say? Does it say how he walked? With God. With God. But does it say how that, how, what does that look like? If you, if you could get taken up to heaven and never die, you can miss the judgment, the, and he died. Wouldn't you want to know how to do it? Well, Moses is writing this probably about the time that the children of Israel are doing donuts in the wilderness, writing this history down. Why wouldn't he put that in there? Doesn't he want the children of Israel to live holy, walk with God better? Why wouldn't he write that instruction down? Huh? It's not God's plan. It had nothing to do with Enoch. Oh, no, don't tell me. It had nothing to do with Enoch? This chapter has nothing to do with Enoch? Right. Are you sure? No. <laughs> you don't, you, well, I'm going to tell you what. I agree with you. This chapter has nothing to do with Enoch. Enoch's walk is not important. If it was important that we were to look at this chapter, oh, wow, you know, en verse 24, Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. Let's have a long discussion on how can I walk more with God, better with God. I want to go like Enoch went. Is it about Enoch? No. Moses wrote nothing about Enoch's life. But we gravitate towards that. What's the other one that we gravitate towards? Methuselah. Methuselah. Why? He was the oldest. Oldest man to ever live. Lived 969 years. Guess what? Jared only lived seven years less than he did. Look at Jared. Jared lived 962 years. Verse 20. Methuselah lived 969 years. That's seven years, I think. Isn't that seven years? Why do we focus on Methuselah? Do you know what we get when we read stuff like this? When we, what kind of uh, teachings we get? Well, before the flood, there was this great canopy over the earth that prevented the ozone from coming in. And that's why people live so long. And they had the nutrients in the ground. And you get this big creationalism sermon. Is that why Noah or Moses wrote this particular passage? Let me rephrase that. Is that why the Holy Spirit led Moses to write this particular passage? Yeah. So nothing to do with Has nothing to do with Methuselah either. Well, what does it have to do? Well, pull yourself back. Go all the way up to the top. It's that about... It sounds to me like it was, they let him live so long to populate the earth. Because that was the whole thing. Well, let's, let, just, I'll, let's just do a quick, quick little look. Look at this right here. Look at this right here. 
When I was little, my grandfather could sing. Grandpa Ed. Beautiful tenor voice. I wanted to be like Grandpa. Grandpa lived how long? About 80? 78? Less, yeah. Okay, let's say, let's, say, let's say 60 of those years, he learned the craft of singing. 60 years. In 60 years, I had a little bit of time with him. I got to learn a little bit. I got to glean from his years of experience, his 60 years. And I gained a little bit of knowledge from him. What do you think would have happened if Grandpa Ed, my grandpa, had 900 years to teach me how to sing? How good do you think of a singer I would be? Not very good, because you really can't sing now. Probably, yeah, okay, not very good, because I can't sing right now. Well, let's, let's think about this one. How about this one? Einstein. Beethoven. A carpenter. A mason worker, someone who works with bricks. A sculptor. An artist. A gardener, a farmer. Let me ask you, Ed, if you had 900 years to learn how to farm, do you think by the end of 900 years you would be the best farmer in the entire world? I'd be better than what I am now. Better than what you are now. How about your next generation? How about, no, 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 let's not do next generation. Let's talk about your son's 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 son. You are able to pass on all that you know, all that you've experienced, all that you learned to your seventh generation. How smart do you think the people seven generations after Adam, how, think, how smart do you think they were? Huh? I think they're beyond wise. I think they were genius. They were a race of people, a group of people that we would not even recognize today. You know, we look back at how the pyramids were built and wonder, well, how in the world did they do that? Those things are 10 tons a piece and they had no modern tool. Do you know what? They're a lot closer to Adam than we are. Look at all that time. Look at the, fir the first set. Adam was able to tutor or teach or uh, bestow. He had a legacy of five generations that he spent 400 years with five generations of his descendants. He was able to spend more than 200 years with seven generations. Do you think God had that purposely planned what does Noah get to do to do what he gets to build an ark I want you to think about what you just said <laughs> Noah number 10 he's not a primitive caveman with Stones that he's chiseled on the end of a little tomahawk. This man has been tutored by hundreds of years of information and science and knowledge and God history. And God says, build an ocean liner. It has to house 72,000 animals. Including dinosaurs. For one, for over a year. For over a year. It's to have three floors. 45 feet high. 75 feet wide. 450 feet long. Oh, by the way, you get to make it out of wood. And that comes from trees which have to be cut and sawed. And smooth shaped and, and yes. pitched and patched and architect. Mind you, there's nothing, there's no description here. He may have been given specifics as far as how many stalls, how wide, how tall. I mean, think about it. You're going to put a giraffe in, in this ark. Actually, it was probably seven. An, huh? Because it's not two by two. I That's the. I know, but you've got you to read the story. <laughs> there were some that were two by two and some were not. Anyway, 
Think about what, ha- what Noah had to possess in his mind to be able to create an ark that would float through the greatest cataclysmic event that has ever happened. The whole earth is covered and erupts with water. Land is torn apart. And he has this boat with all these animals, all these birds, every little... I mean, not to mention, how do you even, how do you even take care of a roach? Or an ant? A university or, degree must have taken two, three, four hundred years. Something. But the man must have been brilliant to be able to do this. I try to go, I try to make a box. Just make a box. I just want to put a box on it. And, and I need him to come by and, and, you know, here's the angle and here's this and you got to do this. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And you're going to make an ark? What's up? Can I play the devil's advocate? Sure. If, if Adam taught all these people and they were so smart and everything, how come they kept screwing up? How come, how come he had to build an ark in the first place? That's a very good, good question, which is also part of what this, ge- this genealogy tells us. Let's go through the genealogy and don't let me forget what that, to answer that question, okay? About how, why, if Adam is passing this, all this information on, how come, how come there are not more godly people? Why did the ark even have to be built in the first place? Why aren't they a bunch of God-loving, God-fearing people through that the whole time? Okay. So, it's obviously not about... Yes? Let me just ask you one thing before you move on. Yes. It says, he, he named him Noah and said, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground. The Lord is cursed. What's that all about? Do you remember back to Genesis chapter 3? Part of the curse was that yeah. the man would have to toil and right. sweat on the ground. What does Lemech say about his son Noah? That he will comfort us. How? Does it say how? And painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. So remember when I said that from the time of Adam all the way through all these generations, these people were looking for that he, that seed that's going to crush the serpent's head? Adam's been telling this story for 900 years. There's going to be somebody come along who's going to crush the serpent's head. He's going to take away this curse. Somehow, some way, for whatever reason, I'm not sure exactly why, Lemech says, Noah, you're the guy. My son will be the deliverer. He will relieve, he will comfort us during this time. It tells me that Lemech knew the story. He knew what Adam had been teaching that whole time about God and about what had happened in the garden. Obviously someone knew because Enoch walked with God. Right? So he must have known too. We're going to find out a little bit later what is significant about Enoch. So here we go. Highest perspective. What does this passage reveal to us about God redemptive, God's redemptive work? Here's number one. It reveals God's commitment to His promise. Genesis chapter 3, God said, I will send one. There will be. I will put enmity and I will send someone to crush your head. That promise is given. It has to end up in Jesus. So what we see is through this particular generation, mind you, how many other sons and daughters did all these people have? Lots. Let's go back to your question. How many of them got on the ark? Not very many. All we know is two. The wives of, uh, or the three, the wives of Ham, Shem, and Japheth, (coughs) Noah's sons. We don't even know where they came from. But that's it. We got eight people get on the on the boat, on the ark. Hmm. That's pretty strange to me. But God says, Adam, I made you a promise. Seth, you're the next one. Enish, you're the next one. Who's the next one after that? 
Kenan, you're next. Jared, you're next. Uh-huh. Or Mah- Mah- Mahalalo, you're next. Jared, you're next. Enoch, you're next. Methuselah, you're next. Lemek, you're next. Noah, you're my man. God is in every single one of those people as far as picking them and making sure that his promise is true. I gave you my word, my promise, it's going to happen. I will ensure that it happens. Despite what we know about these people, these people don't, we don't even know that Methuselah was all that great. Is there anything that says that Methuselah was a righteous man and walked with God? Do you know when he died? The year of the flood. Hmm. Do you know what that means? He may have died in the flood. He may not have gotten on the ark. He died in the year of the flood. When did the flood take place? The second month. Second month of that year. Lemek, Lemek died five years before the flood. That means he saw Noah build the ark. So when Noah is out there going, come on, the, the judgment is coming. God is going to judge. Get on the boat. Get on the boat. Get on the boat. Come on, come on, come on. 90 some odd years, about 96, 98. Time he's using to build this ark. And he's preaching. He's telling. The New Testament tells us he preached that time. Get on the boat. Get on the boat. Get on the boat. God's judgment is coming. Do you know he's preaching to? His father, his brothers, his sisters, his grandfather, aunts, uncles. He's talking to his relatives. Get on the boat. God's judgment is coming. They weren't on the boat. They didn't get on the ark. His wife, three sons, and their wives. That's it. They only have one wife apiece. One wife apiece. God's commitment to that promise, that line. Two, it reveals God, His work is a covenant, not a human work. There's nothing in here that specifies that any of these people were, it did anything special to deserve to be in that line. When we get to Noah, you go in chapter 6, verse 8. You have the first part of 6 says the whole world's fallen fallen apart they're all doing evil 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 verse 8 but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord Whew. Grace God gave Noah grace God says I'll give you favor Yes Does anyone else see a similarity here of with a, a promise made and a long period of time and what are we waiting for now we're waiting for the promise Messiah to come and take us and we want to be sure we're in the boat so to speak figuratively speaking we, we talked about this idea of at this time these people are looking forward they're trying they're looking for that promise what has been promised the promise is that there's a deliverer coming and we now have also a promise. That promise is not finished. It is not finished at the cross. This is what we talked about in Sunday school today. The cross is not the end. The Old Testament people looked forward to the coming of the Messiah and the cross. We are told that we look backwards to the cross. Well, guess what, folks? It's not the cross that's the end. The end, the cross is just the means to the end. It's the future with Christ as our husband, basically. He will be our king and we'll be in front of him forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's the end. That's the promise. That's the end goal. That's what God's working towards. Even now. Even now, just as God was in every single detail of every single generation that we read in that genealogy, God is also in every single one of your lives doing exactly what He needs to do to make sure that that end is going to happen. So, when trouble hits you, uh, yeah, 
Are you in the boat? Are you on the ark? And we're, gonna, we're not going to have time to go, obviously we're not going to have time to go into the flood. I wish we could, but we're not going to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it at the end of this particular section. But here we go. So that's, that's, that's that part. We're going to look at the ark next time. So it reveals his work to be covenant. It's part of his promise. I made a promise. I'm going to make sure it happens. And he's going to ensure that it happens. We find that Noah, he makes a promise, a covenant with Noah. Later he makes a, pro- a covenant with Abraham. Later he makes a, a covenant with David. He makes a covenant with Moses. God is a covenant God. And those covenants are stepping stones to his end goal. He ought to be sick of us by now? Is that what you said? (laughs) Yeah, I know, but you're getting ahead. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. You're in chapter 6 already. What's the third thing that it says? It reveals God's character in redemption. How many times did you read, and then he died? Eight times. And that doesn't include Noah, because guess what? Even Noah dies. Why is that significant? Why would it be important to know that despite their 900 plus years on earth, then he died? Well, because that's to do. It goes back to a whole judgment thing. Goes back to here, huh? Part of God's promise of rescue is also God's promise of judgment. He said, the day, the moment that you eat of it, you shall surely die. They didn't die right away. It took 900 some odd years. But do you know what? Moses says, Hmm. or God says through Moses, I need to let people know they died. God's judgment is absolute. Absolute. Guess what? We will die. Unless he comes back beforehand and takes us to heaven in a blinking of an eye. But otherwise, we're going to die. That's part of the judgment. It shows his character. How many people have not died in all of history except, except Jesus? Actually, he did die. Enoch, Enoch is one. Oh, Elijah. Elijah. Who's Elijah? Elijah's in uh, Kings. We'll get him later on. He was a prophet. Question, and I'm just going to play, play something. Shh. In Revelation, at the end time, there will be two witnesses. And they will be given awesome power. I mean incredible power in Jerusalem. And they will be God's witnesses during that Antichrist time, that end time. The really end, end time. And then they will be killed. And for three and a half days, I believe it is, they will be uh, displayed for all to see. Do you know what one of the powers is? They'll be given the power to stop the rain. Who had that? Who is? Who was that known for? Elijah. Elijah. Stop the rain. Just say, pray, and it stopped. A lot of the things you go back and read. Enoch and Elijah are the only two people that have never died. But. But the witnesses will be killed for three, three and a half days, I believe. And at the end of three and a half days, God will breathe life back into them and they will stand up and he will take them immediately into heaven. So even well, they die. So even God they die. Said. I'm not saying that those two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah. I'm just saying, could be. Could be. It's appointed unto man once it's done. Yeah, I think it almost has to be. But it's also God's grace. Right. Here, here's, here's the other one. We have, what does this reveal? It reveals God's judgment, that he's faithful to his judgment. His holiness he is faithful to. He will not abide by sin. But it's also grace. 
Because guess who comes along at the end of it? Noah. And what is Noah going to do? He's going to build an ark. And on that ark, God's going to put his people inside. And it says in chapter 7 that he closed... Chapter 7? Yep. It says in chapter 7 that God puts them in and then God closes the door. Shuts them in. Shuts the door. I want you to think about that. In the ark, God is the one that closes the door. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. We have another picture. Kind of makes you wonder how bad things actually had to get in order for God to do that. Because, well, because think, you think about things are pretty bad now. So right. We well, to, are our, they worse then? Here we go. I'm going to give this. This is another one that goes back to this one here. Another picture that this particular genealogy gives you. We have a couple people here who were around World War II time, born around that time, right? How many people, how many of you would look at where we are today and say, "Oh wow, it has really gotten bad." It has really gotten bad. How many generations is that? In two generations, actually, because you're here, that would be three. Because you're the third generation. You have someone uh, mom's age, you have someone my age, and someone your age. That's three generations. In three generations, we have gone from what you remember to what it is now. Now. Are any of these particular people that live these hundreds and hundreds of years, are any of them without sin? Imagine what our generations, the three that are in here right now, imagine what type of evil this world would be in if we were all allowed 200, 300 years to let whatever we did in the last three generations go longer and longer and longer and longer. Can you imagine how wicked sin, how corrupt sin after all those years? No. I think Hitler would have been nothing compared to what was going on back then. Really? Nothing. <laughs> Hitler had what? Hitler Hitler had how much time? How much? How much time? Yeah, let Hitler live eight hundred years. Can you imagine? Can you even put it in your head how corrupt this world must have been at that time? Yeah, but in a couple of hundred years after the flood, it was just as bad as it was. Before. It absolutely was. Maybe worse. But we got this picture, we got this, 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 again, how does that fit? It fits that the image has been broken. The, 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 it's scarred. Sin is perpetually getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So what does God have to do? Can God allow man to stay alive for 900 years anymore? Not if he wants to slow down sin. If he wants to slow down evil... He'll shorten their lives. Now I can't teach you all the ways that I learned how to be evil. You're going to have to learn them a little bit on your own. Oh, by the way, I'm going to confuse all your tongues too. Now you won't be able to tell each other how to be so corrupt. Romans. Romans chapter 1 talks about how they did not just sin, but they invented new ways to sin. Worse and worse because they live so long. Just as genius as they were with the arts and sciences and, and ologies and all that, they were just as experienced in sin. So here comes Noah. And what does Noah say? Noah tells us that God is faithful. That God is faithful. It's fearful to get into the hands of God's judgment. 
but to be in His grace is a wonderful, wonderful blessing. And it's because God is faithful to His plan. Not because of us. So what do we walk away with? God is faithful to His promise and as a purpose. Apart from God's sovereign grace, it is a fearful fact that sin is in all of us. And we will all someday die. But God. That's, that's, the, that's the hallelujah. But God sends a Noah. But God finds a Moses. But God chooses Abraham. But God anoints David. But God sent the ultimate son of promise, the he that crushed Satan's head. Now Satan's dead. And when I say dead, I don't mean that he's literally dead and can't do anything. What I mean is, is that he is completely powerless. Just wait right now. It's dead. He's dead. He defeated Satan. He defeated, Jesus defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated the sting of death. There is nothing left. Explain that. His power of uh, to enslave God's people is dead. Meaning Satan has power over his people. He's the god of this world, supposedly. That's one of the names for him, is god of this world. He blinds unbelievers' eyes and minds, keeps them from believing. God has to... Uh, what's that called when drug addicts need... Intervention. intervention. That's it. That, it. Very much like an intervention. You have a drug addict... Really going overboard, losing it, has no ability to get out. You intervene. You send some people that will actually go into their home and intervene into their lives, forcefully go in their lives. God has to do that. He has to intervene. And he has to remove Satan's power, Satan's hold. And he did that through Jesus. He gave, God has the means to do that through Jesus. And it goes all the way back to this one. Jesus paid or received God's judgment for our sin. Therefore, God can love you. We'll go more into it when we go into the ark and things like that. Okay? So, God is faithful. Phyllis, God is faithful. Despite what you might see, despite what we might go through, God is faithful. Why? Because he has a plan. And there is no man, no woman, no force anywhere ever that can change God's plan. Yes? Um, I think the bottom line is to remember Noah believed God. He believed God. Mm -hmm. And he obeyed God. When the others were not believing, they were not believing, they were not obeying, they were right. not... Yeah. Right. So at this time in our lives, at the end time, I think it's critical that we know the word we read about God and we believe him. Don't doubt what he says. Well, it's, uh, when you talk about don't doubt... Hang on, Noah believed, he obeyed. We need to know the word for our day. We don't have an Adam that's 900 years old to tutor us. But we have about 6,000 years of God's word, God's revelation, that can teach us. But you've got to know it. You've got to open it. You've got to read it. You've got to find it. And that's why I want to... Why this... This idea of perspective, I think, is so important. Because if we don't have the right perspective, we will miss 
God's plan. We will miss God's purpose. And if we miss God's purpose and God's plan, we will get the details all messed up. We'll be like Naomi or one of the people in this generation that has no idea where things are going. But we can hang on to a faithful God. Questions? Let's pray.